Hello film friends, this is Stacia, welcome back. And this week we are going to talk about the Oscars. And we're not gonna talk about this year's Oscars. There are plenty of people on the internet doing that right now and probably doing it a lot better than I could. We're gonna talk about Oscars past and I'm gonna do a little series that I like to call my favorite Oscar years. These are going to be the years that I think that the Academy got it right with its nominees and winners. Um, of course, there could be a few worthy nominees missing because there's, a, there's only so many positions in a category and nominees that there can be. And if they open it up to even more nominees, then the show would be even longer and it already clocks in at over three hours long and I doubt anybody wants that and I certainly do not. Um, so we are going to start out with Oscar year 1980, celebrating the films that came out in the year 1979. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. So the reason that this is one of my favorite Oscar ceremonies is it's the first ceremony I remember watching in full. I remember parts of the year before, but not that much. I was really young. It also includes my, some of my favorite movies of all time. It was the 52nd Academy Awards and it aired on April 14th, 1980. It was held at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. The host was Johnny Carson and over 49 million people watched the show in just the USA that year, which was actually 6% above the number that watched it the previous year unlike trends now where the percentage goes down and down and down each year. The show was three hours and 15 minutes long and Kramer vs. Kramer and all that jazz led total nominations with nine nominations each. The best picture nominees were uh, the divorce drama Kramer vs. Kramer starring Dustin Hoffman, Meryl Streep, Justin Henry and Jane Alexander. All of those people were also nominated in the acting categories, including Justin Henry, who was just eight years old at the time and remains the youngest acting nominee ever. Also uh, nominated the Francis Ford Coppola Vietnam epic Apocalypse Now. Uh, and of course it starred Martin Sheen, Marlon Brando, Robert Duvall, and a very young Lawrence Fishburne. Robert Duvall was the only one in this film that got an acting nomination, but Apocalypse Now did get eight nominations overall that night. Bob Fosse's Finley Veiled biopic, All That Jazz, starring my personal boyfriend Roy Scheider, Jessica Lange, Anne Ranking, and then again my other boyfriend Ben Vereen. Um, Roy Scheider was the only person to receive an acting nomination for all that jazz and this movie is my personal favorite of the night also nominated was peter yates's breaking away it starred dennis christopher dennis quaid daniel stern barbara berry and jackie earl haley uh, barbara berry was the only one to receive an acting nomination um, for my money this is the weakest of the best picture nominees I would have rather seen it go to the China Centrum. That would be a better option, but the China Centrum did come out earlier in the year. It came out, I believe, in March of 79. And as we all know, movies that come out earlier in the year are often more forgotten um, when it comes to Oscar love. But Breaking Away is also a good movie um, and a good watch, um, but not the most memorable one of each of these. Uh, last but not least in the Best Picture um, nominees was the Union drama Norma Ray, directed by Martin Rift. He was the only director out of the Best Picture nominees to not receive an Oscar nomination for Best Director. The fifth Best Director spot actually went to the director of La Cage et Faux. Um, and of course Sally Field was nominated for her Oscar for Best Actress. And out of these, Kramer vs. Kramer won Best Picture. And I know a lot of us nowadays will say, what, it beat Apocalypse Now? 
And I'll have to tell you that Kramer vs. Kramer was actually the most popular film of 1979. It was the highest grossing and a lot of us nowadays consider Apocalypse Now a classic, but at the time it was kind of controversial and not too well received. Some people like Roger Ebert saw it as a movie that, you know, 20 years from now that we would appreciate more and that would be the classic which you know to his credit he is right but at the time Kramer vs. Kramer was the odds on favorite and you know it is a great movie and if the Oscars are nothing it is like especially these older Oscars are a time capsule of the times they were in and family dramas did well at the box office back then and they don't really do that well now and Divorce was on a lot of people's minds back then, so I mean, it takes the top winning. And like I said, my personal favorite is all that jazz, but I'm not mad at Kramer versus Kramer winning. It is a great movie, and I am not a child of divorce, but every time I watch that movie, I just start crying. It is beautifully active, beautifully done, and it is. As you can tell, everybody who acted in it got a Oscar nomination, at least the main cast. So the next category is directing, and there was Robert Benton for Kramer vs. Kramer, Bob Fosse for All That Jazz, and I highly recommend every Bob Fosse movie. If you watch them, they're all great. I don't think he made a bad movie in his career, and he didn't make that many, so if you want to watch them, <laughs> it won't take you that long. But then you had Francis Ford Coppola for Apocalypse Now, Peter Gates for Breaking Away, and Edward Molinaro for La Casa Um, Robert Benton, of course, the director of Kramer vs. Kramer, won that night, like I said before. It is a brilliant film, but I think nowadays people think, well, how come Francis Ford Coppola didn't win, but my pick would always be Bob Fosse. Uh, then we go on to the category for Best Actor. Dustin Hoffman for Kramer vs. Kramer, Jack Lemmon for The China Syndrome, Al Pacino for And Justice for All, Roy Scheider for All That Jazz, and Peter Sellers for being there. And Dustin Hoffman did go on to win this for Kramer vs. Kramer. Like I said, Kramer vs. Kramer had a very good night that year. Um, and there's really no wrong pick of anybody who is in this category. Of course, I will tell you that my favorite is Roy Scheider. Like I said, he is my boyfriend and I know he has passed away, but he will always be my boyfriend, even though he did not know me personally. And my other pick would be Peter Sellers for Being There. If you have not seen Being There, it is a great political satire and you should just stop right now and go watch me. And so the next category would be for Best Actress. We had Sally Field for Norma Rae, Jill Clayburgh for Starting Over, another divorce drama, uh, Jane Fonda for The China Syndrome, Marsha Mason for Chapter 2, which I believe is another divorce drama, and you have Bette Midler for The Rose. Sally Field really had a career turn in the 70s where she went from this light-hearted sitcom girl to being you know the serious dramatic actress and this is one of the two roles that came out in the 70s that made her a real contender and changed her career the first was the tv movie sybil for which she won an emmy for me playing um a girl with multiple personalities the other one is Norma Ray, um, and she did go on and win that night. Um, all of these are fine performances. Uh, I love the movie The China Syndrome, um, and I always love Jane Fonda, no matter how controversial she is to some people. Uh, the other person that really stands out in this category is Bette Midler for The Rose. Uh, she played a thinly veiled Janis Joplin. Um, character in this movie they could not get the rights to Janis Joplin's story from the family 
so they couldn't use the music. So they took the script and fictionalized it and made it about a fictional singer. But if you know about Janis Joplin, you will see that that is indeed who Bette Midler is playing. And it really made Bette Midler into an actress. She had acted in some things before this, but this was really her first starring film role. And she did a really great job. I do recommend you see the rose and support your local Bette Midler. Uh, the next category is Best Supporting Actor. You had Melvin Douglas for being there, Robert Duvall for Apocalypse Now, Frederick Forrest for The Rose, Justin Henry for Kramer vs. Kramer, and Mickey Rooney for The Black Stallion. Like I said, Justin Henry was only eight years old. And he had been nominated for a lot of awards for his role in Kramer vs. Kramer. He really does an excellent job in that movie. Most notably is he lost at the Golden Globes for Best Supporting Actor. And back then they did have a category for Best Newcomer, which he was also nominated in, or Best Young Performer, or Best New Young Performer, something like that. And he lost both of those. Um, leading him to start crying that night um, and Melvin Douglas felt sorry for him as well but didn't want to go up against a kid in his categories anyway but Melvin Douglas was also very sick at the time he did end up winning for his role in being there and I know again the apocalypse now in the room everybody's going to say how could you not give it to Robert Duvall but I challenge you, go watch Being There. It is a great movie. I think it holds up today. It is one of my favorites of all time, along with all that jazz from this year. They are both one of my fa uh, favorite movies of all time, along with Apocalypse Now. I love Apocalypse Now. But um, I challenge you to go watch that. Melvin Douglas is brilliant in the movie. And, you know, I take nothing away from Robert Duvall. He was actually a front runner leading up to this, but the dark horse was always Melvin Douglas, and he pulled it off, and he didn't even attend the ceremony that night. Like I said, he had been very sick. He was 79 years old at the time, and in 1980, 79 was well above life expectancy. And also in this category, you have Mickey Rooney, and I think his nomination was for sentimental reasons. He is Mickey Rooney. He was the heyday of, you know, the golden age of film. People love him. He is good in The Black Stallion, but I think it's more of a career honoring nomination for him. So then we have Best Supporting Actress. And of course we have Meryl Streep in, you guessed it, Kramer vs. Kramer. Jane Alexander, also from Kramer vs. Kramer, Barbara Berry for Breaking Away, Candace Bergen for Starting Over, and Muriel Hemingway for Manhattan. And of course, Meryl Streep does win this, and she is fantastic as, you know, 10 out of 10 Meryl Streeps are. Uh, she, you know, was always the front runner for this. Nobody was going to take that away from her. And this is her first nomination and first win of her many, many 20, what, she's been nominated 21, 22 times now. Um, so that night, Kramer vs. Kramer went on to win the most awards with winning five awards. All that jazz did end up winning four awards and Apocalypse Now and Norma Ray each won two awards and so I know these awards aren't perfect there are a lot of classic films that came out in 1979 that weren't even really nominated or they were just nominated in one or two categories ones that come to mind were that's the year that Mad Max came out um, Alien came out that year and it did win Best Visual Effects which rightfully so and one of my personal favorite movies, The Muppet Movie came out that year and I would say that The Rainbow Connection should have won Best Song that year I mean that's my opinion and I think it should be everybody's opinion who doesn't love Rainbow Connection The Muppet Movie is such a great movie but all in all I think the nominees were pretty solid there's no outrageous ones that year where you're like, 
how the hell did that get nominated? You know, there's always the glaring, you know, oh my god, Marlon Brando didn't get nominated, Martin Sheen didn't get nominated. There are a lot of things that could have been nominated, but there's only five slots in each category. And if you open it up to just as many nominees as you could, then the show would be longer. And like I said, this show itself was three hours and 15 minutes. And I doubt anybody wants them any longer than that. I certainly don't. And I know that the award ceremony itself is still that long, if not even longer. And we have to remember we're also looking at, at it through 2023 eyes. Like I said, back in 1979, Kramer vs. Kramer was the front runner. It was the highest grossing movie of that year. There was no reason for it not to get all these nominations and win that year. And the true test of a movie being a classic is how it is regarded, not necessarily when it comes out, but how people look at it in 10, 20, 30 years. So, I mean, the apocalypse now in the room is, you know, it went on to be the classic that it deserves to be, which Kramer vs. Kramer also deserves to be a classic. So does the China Center. So does all that jazz. Like I said, being there, all of these deserve a watch. Uh, the nominees also mirrored a lot of the critics' top 10 list that year. The reviews of the ceremony were one from Detroit Free Press wrote, in any event, the 52nd Academy Awards presentation will stand as one of the smoothest, most predictable, and most recent, reasonable Oscar nights in history. Also, last, one of the most boring. It is always more exciting when something doesn't go the way it's supposed to be, or if there are nominees that you're like, what? How did this happen? So, you know, it stayed. It's predictable. Johnny Carson did a good job. You can look these things up on YouTube. You can watch the opening monologue. The award ceremony is pretty much still like it is today. They haven't radically changed anything. It's just, you know, people's taste of watching award shows has changed. So you're not going to have as many people watching. And you have to remember, we only had three TV networks back then. So, of course, these things got so many viewers because we didn't have anything else to really watch we didn't have the internet you could read listen to radio go to the movies you know or go outside and a lot of the times in the evening we'll just watch television and the oscars was at least something new to watch i think the academy these days has to look at what it wants to become and really probably lean into going after film fans and go with its strength of you hold the history of movies with all of your awards. It's been going on for 95 ceremonies now. This is my first in my Oscar favorites series of years past. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you join me next time for the next video. I will pick another year and tell you why I think it's one of my favorite ceremonies, but thank you for watching and see you next time.